Hey, this is Clay Richardson, Chief Accelerator with Digital Fast Forward. And I wanna share with you three big innovation leadership lessons I learned from my dad. And I had a chance over the summer to spend a lot of time with my dad, who was a really helped shape my life. Like a lot of us with our parents, they we realize as we uh, grow into adulthood and grow older into adult, adulthood that our parents and our parents' values really shaped our lives, right? And I think, you know, if you're anything like me, I probably spent the first half of my adulthood denying <laughs> that my parents and, and their values had anything to do with my success. But then really over, you know, the last 10, 15 years, I got a chance to really see the investment of time, energy, and yelling that my parents made really had an impact on me in my younger life and even now more so. And with my dad during the summer, I learned that he wasn't doing well. We found out that he had cancer and it really prompted me to start spending much more time with them and just asking him a lot of questions. And some of this motivation that I had to start asking my dad questions and starting to understand his background a little bit more really came from a mentor of mine, Brendan Bouchard. And I know a lot of you know I follow Brendan, but Brendan's story around his dad definitely inspired me. And one of the things Brendan did that I would suggest anybody just take time to do this, but he shared that when his dad was uh, had fallen ill and was diagnosed with only a few weeks, I think it was a few weeks or a few months to live, what Brendan did was took time to interview his dad and asked him, I can't remember the number of questions, but it might have been somewhere in the range of 15 to 20 big questions about his dad's life, what his aspirations were, why he did what he did, you know, what some of the struggles of his life were. And Brendan actually recorded this, right, which was just amazing. Uh, and he had shared it. And that inspired me when my dad, I knew his time was short, to really start having these conversations and asking really questions that I, I knew I wouldn't get a chance to ask later, but was always burning within me. And I just remember uh, at one point, you know, probably about three, four days before my dad passed away, I, I just asked him what he felt were the values that shaped him and shaped his success in life. And I'll actually share uh, a little bit from his obituary. Uh, and it's just amazing when I read uh, his obituary and how much he was able to accomplish in his life. My dad passed at a very young, 84 years old. Uh, but the things he was able to do, and even up until the very end, just was really sharp. I love to tell the story, uh, <laughs> share with people. Like a couple of days before my dad passed, he had me call American Express Platinum Card to make sure that his balance was paid off. That says everything right there, right? About the type of person he was, the commitment that he had. And literally we're in the hospital and he's just like, hey, can you get the phone and make a call <laughs> for me to American Express? And I'm like, dad, we already paid your bill. Like I already took care of it. It's all good. There's no, you know, and it just, you know, the just seeing him go through that period inspired me more and more. And just having the opportunity to be there and ask him these questions. And like I said, the question that I asked him I would say three or four days before he passed of just what were the values that were most important to shaping your success and were most critical to what you were able to accomplish in life. And, you know, when I asked him the question, he just looked at me like, why are you asking me this crazy question right now? <laughs> right? Like, come on, just let me rest. Right. And, you know, and I, he asked me like, well, what's the question? Right. I said, so what, what, what were the things 
the values that were most important to shaping your success in life and the outcomes you had, right? And so when he heard it again and he saw, I was serious about the question, right? He saw the look on my face like, oh, you're serious about this. You wanna have this conversation. And so he started walking me through and as I listened to the values, it made me think about innovation leadership and just how the three values he shared are at the core of what it means to be an innovation leader and that we have to really work at all the time, right? And so I wanna share these with you and really just give them to you as a foundation of how to continue leveling up as an innovation leader, right? And I've taken these on every day, just looking at how do I embody these values every day when it comes to innovation, whether that's in my personal life or whether that's in my job or career, right? In terms of what I'm doing work at work and with work to day to day and the impact that I want to have. And so I'm going to share these three with you. The first value that he shared that I, I just was like, okay, that makes sense. Knowing my dad growing up was work ethic. And this sounds like a common, like what's so special about work ethic, except when my dad shared that, I, it just kind of reminded me so much of growing up and the environment that I grew up in around my dad. And for some, some of the audience know, you know, my family, I grew up in upstate New York, uh, in Rochester, New York, and my family in upstate owned tire stores, right? And as a kid, I would actually, my dad would get me up in the morning and take me to one of those tire stores to work in the cold. This is like, I'm talking, I was probably like six years old, man, you know, and he would get me up early, you know, six, seven years old. Uh, we would go to the tire store, change tires and, you know, just do everything, right? And it was like, it didn't matter that I was six years old to my dad. What mattered was like, he wanted me to learn and have a solid work ethic. And so, that, that's a big part of innovation. And I know for my dad, that work ethic was just unbelievable. Like I think most of the people that uh, remembered him or people that I talked to, you know, just remembered his work ethic. And he, you know, just, and I, I know a lot of our parents are like that, just worked right up until we could not work anymore, right? Just that work ethic was so strong. And I asked him, where did he get his work ethic from, right? I just was like, hey, so yeah, I get it. I got the, uh, <laughs> you know, not scars, but probably emotional scars from when I was a kid to validate the work ethic that you instilled in me, that my dad instilled in me, and also that he instilled and he came with and instilled in others. But I asked him, where did you get it from? And what he shared was that he got his work ethic from his granddad. And his granddad grew up, he grew up partly on a farm in South Carolina. And his granddad ran his, had his own farm at a time when black people really weren't even allowed to have land, right? And just the work ethic my dad was sharing that his granddad, Sid, put in to just be able to farm, work the land and really grow crops and even sell it, right? And at the time, you couldn't even truly sell crops as a African-American, as a black person in the South, but the work ethic my dad was sharing, that's where he got it from. And I think as innovation leaders, that's really the foundation because we're always gonna be faced with challenges. We're always going into challenges and it does require a high work ethic in terms of being able to get the work done work day in, work day out, and sometimes not always get the outcome that you want, right, or expect. And so that one I thought was big. When he said work ethic, I was like, all right, now we're having the conversation and not just at the surface, but breaking it down to where did it come from? Why is it important? And for us as innovators, like how do we begin to embody that today, 
right? What is our work ethic? What is our, we talk about high performance and that high performance mindset, but it's also at the core is that work ethic, right? Just showing up, getting it done. And so I kind of prided him on like, okay, so what's the second one, <laughs> right? My dad's like, oh Lord, dude, like cut me some slack here, right? And I said, well, I'm just curious, what's, what was the second value that was most critical to your success? And what he shared with me in the second one, and this one was big, this is big value, is follow through, right? And essentially what he was sharing with me in that follow through is that as an entrepreneur, serial entrepreneur, his biggest weapon in terms of moving things forward was making sure that he followed through on his commitments, right? And I, I love that. And again, I'm, I'm sitting there like a you know two-year-old, three-year-old, right? Just like, all right, dad, tell me more, right? Like, why, why was follow through so important? Like, what did that mean for you? Like, not just the surface follow, like we all know we need to follow through. And I asked him, well, why, like, give me more, like, help me understand. What do you mean in terms of just follow through, right? And he said, what he shared with me and just stuck with me is, you know, when he was younger, when he launched the first tire store, and he would go and he would pick up tires because they sold new tires and used tires. But he would go and pick up tires from other car dealerships or other uh, tire shops, right? But would pick up these tires. And he said, you know, sometimes he'd have to go and pick up tires in the cold. So think about Rochester, upstate New York, a lot of snow, a lot of cold. Uh, you know, that's why I don't live there now because it was so cold, right? But a lot of cold snow and he would go pick these tires up in the dead of winter. And what he shared is a lot of times when he was picking up tires, you know, and there'd be like maybe hundreds of tires he needed to pick up, put on the truck. And he shared that sometimes he'd get halfway through and it's just like, you know what? I'll come back tomorrow, this is too much. But then he would remind himself, if I don't get it done now, I actually won't come back tomorrow. There's the chances of me coming back tomorrow, if I don't get this done now, is zero, right? And so he shared that story with me to say, so he always knew he had to follow through, just get it done, right? And so that stuck with me even after, and I, it's, it was always in me, but I think hearing him share it like that, it just stuck with me in terms of just from an innovation perspective, we have ideas, we know we have great ideas, but it's that follow through to say, let me go through and test the idea out. Let me experiment with it. Let me actually apply design thinking to drive the idea forward, right? And that's the part that just that, I think that one out of the three that he shared just, lit me up in terms of, yeah, when we have an idea, we want to follow through. But also just day-to-day -day life, when we commit, how do we follow through, right? If we have an idea, not just following through at the beginning, but really going all the way through, no matter what the outcome is, okay? So that follow through one, that I'll be very candid with you, that one powered me over the last, I would say probably the last 30, 40 uh, days because, and just share this with you, I, before my dad passed, I'd signed up for a marathon, a half marathon up in San Jose. And, uh, you know, once my dad passed, you know, I was like, oh, am I gonna run this freaking marathon, half marathon, this is out of control. Like I really haven't trained the way I needed to. Uh, you know, like, do, am I gonna run this mar half marathon? And something came to me, follow through. You signed up for it, follow through. And I will share with you, I just ran the marathon this past uh, Sunday and did my best time ever for a half marathon. And so I'm not gonna tell you what the time is because I know how people are out there in, in my audience. It's like, you did what time, Clay? All right, let's let's, race, let's go to a half marathon together, right? And I'll just tell you, best blistering time, but that went from, 
I don't know if I'm going to do this marathon to follow through a saying, I'm going to do it and I'm going to do my best time. And so as an innovation leader, that's the mindset we have to build is follow through. What's the commitment and just following through on really innovation and new ideas. Okay, so that that's the, the first one is uh, work ethic. Second one is follow through. And then the last one is be true to who you are. I just have it as be true to you. Um, and this one was, you know, when he was sharing this with me, it kind of kind of caught me off guard because I'm like, well, yeah, okay, be true to who you are. And I'm thinking like as a kid, my dad was definitely like, yeah, don't be true to who you are, Clay, <laughs> right? I shouldn't say that, but definitely there was an image he wanted like, okay, I think you should do this and do this, right? And I think that's all parents. But ultimately what he was saying is it's so critical to be authentic, right? To be true to who you are. And I think that is such an important part of being an innovator and just being creative. Because a lot of times when you're creative or if you're working in innovation, you're gonna have to step out of the normal role and step into who you truly are. You, it's hard to be an innovator if you're not, and particularly innovation leadership, if you're not showing up authentically, if you're trying to pretend to be something, like, and I know people, you know, that I, I've worked with and people that I've coached that really focus on the image of being an innovator and not necessarily like true to who they are. And I think you see this from time to time out there, but if you look at the true innovators, they're so authentic. If you look at, you know, Jim uh, Kelly, uh, so if you think about the IDEO founders, the brothers, uh, they're true to who they are. If you think about even Steve Jobs, a lot of people say Steve Jobs was an asshole, but he was definitely true to who he, he was, right? And I think that's how we need to show up. And it just, when my dad shared that, it made me think about him, right? And just how he uh, lived his life in terms of, you know, he had tire stores, a very blue collar job or blue collar industry, but drove a Porsche 944. I'll see if I can find a picture of the Porsche, uh, but it's still in mint condition, 1988 Porsche 944. And I remember I stole that car one time. Oh my God, this is probably the best ride for a teenager. I think I was 17 at the time and I stole it and took it for a ride. But the thing with him is you know, the, the being true to who he was, was, hey, yeah, guess what? I own tire stores. It's a very dirty job, but I drive a red Porsche 944, <laughs> right? And even as a kid, what he would have me do when I, summers, I would work in the shop as I was growing up, as I got, you know, college, high school, I would work in the shop, but then, you know, when I was finished working for the day, my dad would say, hey, on the way home, I need you to stop by Wegmans, where like for a lot of people know Wegmans kind of started in that Rochester area, the grocery store Wegmans. And I would, you know, I would hate to stop at Wegmans on my way home because I'd be so dirty, right? From <laughs> changing tires or working on cars, whatever. Right? I used to hate to stop by Wegmans, especially when I was in college. I'm like, I'm a college student. I shouldn't have to be doing this type of work. And I got to stop by Wegmans now and people are going to see me. And, and the Wegmans that uh, where we live, where I grew up, is out in Fairport. And this is like probably one of the widest areas of Rochester, right? I should say it like that. But, but and I'm this black kid looking all sooty and dirty going into Wegmans to get groceries or pick up whatever my dad had me pick up. I think he used to do this just to teach me this lesson, right? Because it would always be something random, like random, like pick up some lamb chops. I'm like, dude, like, what are you, pick up lamb chops? What are you talking about, right? And so, uh, so I would go in, you know, looking dirty, sooty, and just like, ah, I really don't want to do this. But what I always appreciated was when I checked out, I always had cash in my pocket and could pay and felt proud of that because 
of what I was able to do by being an entrepreneur, by being a part of the business, right? And so it's that sense of like, be true to who you are, right? Like ultimately me having soot or being dirty, it wasn't a representation of who I truly was. And, but at the same time, it was a part of who I was. Right. And so I think that's the lesson I took from my dad in when I was younger in that situation. But listening to him talk about it as I got as you know, when he was a few days away from passing, it really struck a chord. And I think that's so important as an innovation leader, that authenticity is essential, is finding yourself, being true to yourself and at the same time being willing to step out and be vulnerable to expose people to who you really are and what you really care about and the dreams that you have in terms of how you want to drive innovation. So those are the three big innovation leadership lessons and really values that my dad shared with me, even though at the time he didn't know uh, that really what he was sharing with me I was looking at it through the lens of innovation. But what I also realized in that conversation is that my dad was the biggest innovator. I just, it's just amazing. Like I, you know, we, I joke that I'm a second generation entrepreneur, but in truth, I'm a second generation, if not third or fourth, you know, once my dad was telling me about his granddad, you know, I'm probably fourth generation innovator right? Definitely second generation. And that's what this really comes down to is how do we continue the legacies, not just of our parents, but of other family that have inspired us to go on this path, right? And so that's what I want to want to leave you with is, is those three values. How do you begin to embody those if you're not already or take it to the next level? That's really what I'm doing. And also encourage you with family, your parents or grandparents, take time to ask them these tough questions. And I'll add a link to the questions from Burchard and to the video uh, that Burchard had, uh, Brendan Burchard had about his conversations with his dad because it's very inspiring in terms of just not looking at uh, losing a loved one as the end, but really an opportunity to open up to a broader conversation to better understand them. And guess what? To better understand yourself. And so this is Clay signing off. Happy innovating. And we will see you on the other side.